Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the University of Michigan Injury Prevention Center Distinguished Faculty Seminar. My name is Sarah Stoddard. I'm the Director of Training and Education. And today's seminar um, will, give, will be given by um, Doug Weave, uh, Professor of Epidemiology in Biostatistics and Epidemiology, Perlman School of Medicine, University of Pennsylvania. He directs the Space Time Epi Group and the CDC-funded Penn Injury Science Center. Um, Dr. Weeb's research interests include environmental risk factors for injury, the method methodologic challenges of activity pattern measurement and exposure measurement, and the impact of daily routines on health-related behavior. A number of his studies examine how keeping a firearm at home relates to homicide, suicide, and unintentional shootings of household members. He also studies issues of the clinical management of trauma and mild traumatic brain injury. Today's talk will focus on how he uses GIS um, assisted activity path interviews and mapped data of the urban lands landscape to investigate how, situa how situations young people encounter and the places they go over their da daily activities relate to the likelihood of violence. Please join me to um, welcome Dr. Weeb. <laughs> Sarah, thanks so much. And Sarah, Rebecca, Jessica, Patrick, everyone hosting me, I really appreciate the time. Jason, everyone. Um, yeah, one of those topics, having a gun in the home and the risk for homicide and suicide, um, was a study that I led that is what really got me into this business. Um, and I'll start by talking about that and then moving into the larger study that had the title on the talk today. Um, I was a doctoral student. Um, as it goes, you start knowing what, what your topic will be and came across an opportunity to do a population-based case control study on a topic that I'd only seen um, studied twice. There were papers in the New England Journal of Medicine in 91 and 92 by Dr. Kellerman, our colleague, that looked at a gun in the home and the risk factor for homicide and suicide. That was conducted in three states and these were sound studies. Um, I and mentors of mine identified that the National Mortality Followback Survey, a sample of death certificates from across the U.S., was a large case study, case population group, and the National Mortality Follow, or the National Health Interview Survey was a large national study of living people. Um, two years of administration were back to back, and they all asked exactly the same questions regarding a gun in the home, what you had, and storage methods. And so bringing these cases together with controls, it was the opportunity for a large population-based case control study. And we conducted that research, and, um, and that was the first study that really motivated me to get into epidemiologic methods and to keep um, firearm injury as a focus of mine. That's where I started in the business. Um, similar to what Kellerman had found, um, there, having a gun in the home was a risk factor for homicide for men, but in particular, it was for women. And this was not a mixed method study. We did not learn about the context, but we can imagine, and from future research, we learn about the context of domestic violence and how having a gun there could indeed increase the likelihood of homicide um, for um, a female partner in the home. So that study, I think, did not a bad job of measuring exposure, even though it was just a few questions on a survey. Um, but because we were working with data that had already been collected, there were, I think, many, many, many possible confounders um, that we couldn't control for and effect modifiers, too. We were working with the data that we had. Um, but that served a purpose, and I'm so glad to say that now, 16 years later, in the annals of um, internal medicine, you can see a meta-analysis of the 13 or 14 or 15 papers that have come since and studied the same question. So, but I drank the Kool-Aid. I was very interested in the mission to make a contribution on firearm injury, given the magnitude of the burden that that takes on the population in the U.S. Um, and as a postdoc, I published that work and then moved to Philadelphia for a faculty job. Um, Philadelphia, the burden of gun violence is just massive across the landscape of Philadelphia. Um, and I'd never been there before. I'd never set foot in Philadelphia before I went there to interview for a job. And I grew up in, in Western Canada. And in Western Canada, when you say something is old, it's like 1950 old. Um, 
in eastern Pennsylvania, or in eastern US, including Philadelphia, older is like 1740. That's when the University of Pennsylvania was established. Moved to Philadelphia, was really enamored by the narrow streets that were made for horses and carriages, and, um, and the profound differences from one street to another that you find in terms of the context that is there. And it is just market. You're, you, know, you might want to buy a house on this street or not on that street because of the context of real estate, for example. And you see it just change rapidly. Um, but you can't say a neighborhood is high or low SES. Um, it's just very um, integrated. And that made for a really good landscape for studying features of the built and social environment in the context of gun violence. Now, not in the home, but gun violence in the community. And I got to Penn, was figuring out what line of research I would pursue first um, with federal funding, which you have to pursue as a young faculty member to, to stay in the business. And another thing that I learned of while I was there uh, was the Philadelphia Negro. It hadn't been introduced to me before I got there. And a re-release of the issue from W.B. Du Bois, um, the first African-American to get a PhD from Harvard. Um, he had then a faculty position at Penn, but it was more of an introductory faculty position. But he was at Penn for a while, did a very large census of um, a large swath of Philadelphia. And Elijah Anderson, at the time I got to Penn, who was in sociology, wrote the foreword to his new book. Um, and a little bit more about what, what set the hook for me for that work. My favorite building on campus at the University of Pennsylvania is the Fine Arts Library. Um, um, uh, Frank Furness is the architect, and it's just beautiful. It's the top of my list when people come to visit. We walk in there and have a look. And there's an art gallery right in the beginning. And it's too bad that this was pre-iPhone panorama view, because I would have taken a photo then but imagine, if you will, that along the wall and bending across the other wall was this amazing map that W.B. Du Bois had done of the Seventh Ward. And so here's a swath of Philadelphia. I actually live in the Seventh Ward today. And look what he did. House by house, he enumerated um, who lived there or what was there. And look at the legend at the bottom. It was kind of a, a category, an ordinal scale ranging from residents of whites, stores, public buildings. Does the mouse show up up there? Um, red is uh, the middle classes, working people, fair to comfortable, the poor, and at the other end of the continuum, vicious and criminal classes. And uh, so you can just imagine if you're me coming to Philadelphia or anyone living in Philadelphia at the time, think about what you might be exposed to just based on the decision of walking down one street to an, to an, compared to another. Um, residents of whites, 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 um, middle classes, middle classes, middle classes, and then, you know, vicious and criminal, vicious and criminal. You can just imagine how you walk down one street and your exposure experience is very different than walking down the other street. And, you know, having been motivated by that first um, couple of publications and knowing that we could all do a better job of measuring exposure and measuring, measuring confounders. And wanting to tackle um, a public health problem that was close to home, we thought about, well, how could we study this in Philadelphia? And we ended up piloting a method to learn from young people about where they spent time in the urban environment um, and where they got shot, and that turned into this grant. Many people to thank for this grant, Charlie Brannis, epidemiologist, Wen Guo, biostatistician, Perry Richmond, trauma nurse, and the list goes on. In fact, Elijah Anderson was a co-investigator as well. Dr. Schwab, chief of trauma at Penn, one of the people who recruited me. Dana Tomlin, an originator of cartographic modeling. So a very interdisciplinary group um, drawing from across the Penn campus to, to study what we call the space-time adolescent risk study. Um, you can see that it was funded by NIAAA, Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, and co-funded by NICHD, Child Health and Human Development. Uh, but I'll, I'll just let you see under the hood a little bit, because this is very relevant. I don't know the extent to which you want to talk about this now or after, but this is one of those rare grants from the NIH that was an R01 that had the word firearms in the title. Um, it also has gunshot in the title, make no mistake. And, and you know, we'd like to think there are there are not consequences for simply what you call a grant. 
Um, but in fact, it can you make you a big target, pun kind of intended. I got this funded when I was a junior faculty member, um, and then feedback came around the time that we started publishing off this, when it became aware to the larger community that the NIH was indeed funding research to tackle this issue as a public health problem. So um, to those in training now, we could talk more about the pros and cons of having firearms in your title. I'd still encourage you to do it, uh, but think about context and, um, and we can talk about, about implications. I'm still here, so it's all good and a happy ending so far. Um, you know, and at the time, another motivation for me, ha have a look at this. We put this together with Charlie and Terry and Dr. Schwab around the time I got to Penn, and we were motivating the need for more funding in firearm research. Over a span of 30 years, total cases in the U.S. of cholera, diphtheria, polo, rabies, four, four diseases, 2,031 cases. Um, over the same amount of time, how many people died by gunshot, in the, gunshot injury? Um, over 3 million in the U.S. Now, NIH awards, you know, was the award, were the awards um, proportionate to the burden? NIH awards for each of these diseases adds up to 320. Anyone want to guess how many awards had been given to study these 3, 3 million um, gunshot injuries? Just shout it out. Zero. Oh, zero is a great guess. And yeah, and if you want to go up from there, don't go up very fast. Zero is a great guess. Um, the first had been actually studying lead poisoning as a function of bullet retention, which, which is a medical and public health problem, it counts. Um, number two was the grant that paid for me out of the line item for project manager to support me at Penn when I got there, which was my mentor, Charlie Brannis's grant, uh, the Philadelphia Gun and Alcohol Study. And then number three was this one. All right, so onward, what did we do with this study? Well, a little bit more motivation of, of the methods that we used. I was also really enamored. It was my mentor, Dana Tomlin, who said, have a look at one boy's day when I was telling him the vision for what I had in mind. And um, Roger Barker is thought of as the father of ecological psychology or the way that people make sense of their environment. This was like circa 1952 in a small town which will remain, remain anonymous. This says Topeka Photo Service on it but in a small town that was anonymous, because this is a research subject, what they did was recruited one subject, and he was nine years old, and his pseudonym was Raymond, and um, they wanted to learn how do young boys spend their time. These were research coordinators, and on one day, with Raymond's agreement and that of his parents, the first coordinator went to the house around seven in the morning, knocked on the door, parents let them in, went upstairs, and they kind of said, okay, now? Yep, now. And the clock started, and they monitored Raymond's activities um, throughout the day. And they took shifts, but like, look how granular these data were. I just love this. 8.33, as he came up the walk in front of the school, he saw two dogs barking and snarling at each other by the bush at the corner of the lot south of the school. So they're mapping Raymond as he navigates his environment, and they also laid out maps so we could really understand where this were. There's the school, auditorium, Here's trees, and here's the bush with the snarling dogs. Raymond comes to school. Injury epidemiologist, dog bites are a serious public health problem. Activity pads, I like this stuff. Um, after school, walked along ridge of garage roof. Like, Raymond, what are you doing? Um, that's how they monitored Raymond's activities. And in a smaller setting with more time, we could talk a lot about the pros and cons of trying to do prospective monitoring in real time, in person, and how that might affect behavior. And honestly, I don't know. In some instances, it may enhance the grandstanding that might happen. And in other instances, it may play it down. But we can all appreciate it's hard to learn about people's activities in real time. Here's how we tried to do it to understand why do people in Philadelphia get shot where they do, when they do. We recruited young people, um, 10 to 24, from the two emergency departments at, uh, at Penn, the Adult One, Hup, and CHOP, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And perhaps like your ED that is right here, um, these places are real machines also for conducting research. And they run a gray coats program. These are not white coats because they're not clinical. Gray coats are typically undergrads taking a course 
um, and motivated to eventually go into med school. And they work 12 hour shifts and their job is to monitor the board and any patient who comes in eligible for a given study, these are the folders for different studies, um, they approach them. And at a clinically appropriate time, they, they try to recruit them. And so we recruited gunshot patients um, through the ED using the AA's program and screen for eligibility and, um, and used a graduated consent procedure by which um, according to you know, whether it was clinically appropriate or not, we, we, we approached them and developed a relationship and said, would you participate in research? We conducted some of those interviews in the hospital, many at participants' homes, um, and about as many at our research office. And if you're involved in this kind of work, you know that when a patient leaves the hospital, it's very hard to be able to follow up with them. We had a lot of creativity to our remuneration structure and the amount of time and the strategies to, to enroll uh, or to enhance enrollment. But we ended up sitting down with individuals and conducting an interview. Part of this is Luke, one of our interviewers, and a key part of the interview was using a laptop with a customized um, geographic information systems interface uh, that we used to sit next to a participant. And I'm just zooming in here to the extent that I could on the satellite photo that we had when we started, just to show you how granular we can get. And we would say, um, show me where you woke up in the morning. And we could zoom in and they'd say, here. And then we, you know, we really, we told them the goal, and a bit of directions, but we said, like, walk us through your day, just like one boy's day. And you can see someone may have walked through the ball diamond, across a basketball court. This is what a swimming pool looks like in Philadelphia in the winter with no water, um, and so on. We had participants walk us through their day. And as they walked us, we had a cue card that we kept on referring to. There were five or six key pieces of information we wanted to know at every step. What's your mode of transportation? Um, are you doing anything else, studying, listening to music, watching TV? We asked, um, how safe did you feel? Which we thought, frankly, was a long shot, but we wanted to try. And very interestingly, I think that the data came out of that were quite valid. Um, uh, but that was outside the primary aims. Also, are th what's involved? Alcohol and drug use, we were very interested in, either by you or someone with you. Um, and then, and who was with you? So we asked people step by step to describe these things. And this is an example of what the data would look like. Um, Bernadette here is lead research coordinator with us. Bernadette, you want to say hi? Yeah. Who is now conducting some of these interviews, but has also trained our other interviewers on the newer version of this application. Dot, here's where I woke up. You put down a dot. And what happens is the first row of this table would pop up, and your job is to populate it with the time of day it happened, mode of transportation, and so on. And then you just have a conversation and go dot, dot, dot as needed to track someone through their activities as, say, the mode of transportation changes from stopping on a corner to hopping on the bus and going to school. And each time you put down a dot, um, a new row would come up. You can imagine this could get, it, it would get very laborious. But we also built in some features to make this go more smoothly. Like if you put a dot here in the top right corner, the whole map would recenter, so you didn't have to scroll, scroll, scroll. And also information would drag down, so you only had to make changes um, as something changed. So we, this is retrospective stuff. We couldn't just put a GPS device on someone and ask them to go forward because our outcome was a statistically rare event. Um, we did this retrospectively. And we ended up coming with a, a way with a lot of stories that were just like this. Here's a 16-year-old who wakes up by this historic cemetery in West Philadelphia. It's a Saturday, walks to this corner, friends pick him up, drives north, goes east, um, across the Schuylkill into Center City, and he hops out, and he's working at the Rite Aid, and he has a job at Rite Aid just north of Walnut Street. Um, after he works there for a few hours, he goes south and he takes a right, and then he is playing basketball at these courts where there's also um, a dog park. And he's there for a few hours with his friends. Um, they finish, they hop on the bus, and they go back across the Schuylkill. This is Franklin Field, the world, the U.S.'s first two-tiered football stadium in the country. Eagles used to play there. Um, goes west into West Philadelphia. And um, they hop out, and they're at a friend's house, and they're gaming for a while in the evening. 
and then they get hungry, they go out to a little bodega, um, they get some cash from the ATM, and then it's on the way back um, when they're assaulted um, and he is shot. And so that's, a, that's the type of narrative that we were able to get from when you wake up until the time of the shooting. For some of our subjects, that was just one or two hours if they were assaulted early in the morning. For some, it was close to 24 hours if they had a very long day. Um, of course, with work like this, I wouldn't show you the exact path of a participant. We adjust things slightly for confidentiality. But this is a very similar story to what we heard about 120 times for gunshot patients, about 130 times for non-gun assault patients, fist, stick, something else, um, and then also for a couple of hundred control participants. Tell me about your day recently that we would designate at random um, and walk us through your day up until you went to bed. Um, a little bit about activity paths that I've been talking about um, a lot with a lot of you while I've been here. You know, so often in the public health and medical research that we do, we want to know where our patients or participants live, put them on a map, figure out what zip code or census tract they live in, and then assign to them characteristics of that environment, median household income, percent Hispanic, um, and so on, as a way to characterize patients, as a way to maybe look at some of those as potential risk or protective factors or manage them as confounders or effect modifiers. Um, and that may work well, we're looking at some research questions, depending on the way I think of it, like the timing between um, onset of exposure and the risk of the outcome happening. If you're studying basal cell carcinoma and you want to know to what extent might a patient have been exposed to sunlight, simply knowing that their zip code was in Southern California and they lived there for 30 years is very different than knowing that someone's zip code was in Massachusetts and they lived there for 30 years. But, you know, but there, the induction period between exposure and outcome might be about 30 years. Here, um, walking down a street in Philadelphia and turning left and not right, the induction period between what you're exposed to and the onset of the outcome being shot is just seconds. So we're very interested in granular data in terms of space and time relative to the exposure outcome relationship that we're looking in. If I had just plunked that last example subject in the zip code where they are in the census tract where they live, it turns out that they traversed seven different census tracts in that little path that I just gave you. Um, when we started these interviews, we started first with an icebreaker um, exercise just to get them used to thinking about maps. And with slight adjustment, this was one of the types of um, maps that we've got back when we started this icebreaker and we said, um, show me where you live specific, and then tell me what you think of as your neighborhood. And this is what one participant did. Well, this is my neighborhood, and look how specific that is. You know, it's, it's here, but it's not here. And it's here, but it's not here. So very specific. We did that, and we published on, on a little case series of these just, just to, to make a point about something that we were finding. Many participants said to us, well, I live here, and this is what I think of as my neighborhood. Some said, I live here, and that's what I think of as my neighborhood, not even where they live. And then we even had more peculiar ones, like I live here, but my neighborhood is dot, dot, dot. Um, beyond, and by the way, it turned out that the neighborhoods that people drew, without exception, never followed um, the boundaries of administrative units like census tracts. Because I don't, I don't know where my census, that just makes sense. Um, and in the field, we talk that way, Activities don't follow these administrative boundaries, but we haven't seen much documentation of that. So here is some. And then beyond that, so here's where you live, here's what you think of as your environment, and then over these 24 hours, where did you spend time? Well, have a look at this. Like, it, it turns out most individuals out of these 10, only this one spent time entirely within their neighborhood. Everyone else was, was here and there. And, and we think it makes sense. Um, all of us do. We wake up somewhere, but then as a function of what we have to do for our routine activities, um, it takes us to a number of places. And well, why not within the neighborhood? We came to have the opinion that the neighborhood here was, was described as a place where they would like to spend time if they could, but on a given day, it's, we don't spend time there. We have responsibilities and do other activities. 
Um, so anyway, we saw that certainly these people would wake up in one place, spend time in quite a few other places, and then we were interested in whether where they woke up had anything to do with the likelihood of being assaulted, um, or better, where they were at the time they were assaulted. What was different about those places than just before, just before, just before, that seemed to be associated with the onset of assault. Turns out, when we look at our data and look at the extent to which, um, two things, prevalence of alcohol outlets in the zip code or census tract where you live, compared to prevalence of alcohol outlets that you walk by in your day, there was just, there was no correlation. Not surprising, an important point to make though. So yeah, I'm talking about alcohol outlets. We're not at the point yet, but Rebecca may get us there where there's a National Institute on Injury. Yay, right? Vote for that. Um, but until that comes, um, we still need to figure out how to compete for research funding. Um, and in this instance, we um, pursued the, the, the pathway whereby alcohol outlets are a risk factor for individuals to get shot. And that's certainly the case. Um, in a city like Philadelphia, much alcohol is consumed for immediate consumption in a large container with no informal guardianship. The person behind the counter is behind bulletproof glass and you can walk outside, consume very little informal guardianship, a lot of vacant lots, and you can sit and drink without many obstacles. And when we, you know, you know the conceptual framework here, alcohol, we, we misinterpret social cues, an environment where there's a lot of firearms, um, shooting might happen. So that was part of the, of the conceptual framework here. So you see that we're mapping people's activities, um, but there really from that exercise, all we get is latitude, longitude, latitude, longitude, super sterile. Um, how do we figure out to what were people exposed? Well, we created different surface layers of the Philadelphia environment. We took those 1700 alcohol outlets for one, created a, a density surface map of Philadelphia where red means more dense. Um, and we can turn it on its side just to kind of show the gist of it. These are mountains where the density of alcohol outlets off premise um, was very high. A protective factor we hypothesized was police stations. These are places where police stations are. And as you get further away, it gets low. Um, structural danger. These are vacant lots and abandoned houses, which vary across the Philadelphia landscape also. So after con conducting those interviews, we laid our activity paths on top of these and then just merged the data. And that's the way that we estimated the extent to which people were exposed as they navigated um, their environments. Um, this paper, the lead one, we ended up publishing in the journal Epidemiology. And you know, so the two main points, this was in fact a case control study. We had cases and controls and compared them for exposure. Um, but we also conducted a case crossover analysis where we compared each individual at the time they were assaulted to themselves earlier in the day, which, which has particular benefits to it. And um, so um, moving quite quickly here, I want to show you the characteristics of the individuals that participated. Um, have a look here and feel free to, to point out anything of interest or to focus on your, your variable of interest here. These are, these are demographics, you see 10 to 24 year olds and we had these three groups. Gunshot case subjects, 123 non-gunshot case subjects, um, 175, and then 274 controls. Um, I've pointed out a few instances where uh, we see some variability. They all were male, by the way. Um, certainly women and young girls um, get shot in Philadelphia too. It just turned out that our enrollment um, was, was focused solely on boys. Um, the great majority were African-American. Um, a place, you, know, you hope that you recruit controls that are representative of the population that gave rise to your cases. Here are a few instances where they're not. We see that, did you receive A's and B's in school? The prevalence of that was a little bit lower in gunshot cases compared to non-gun cases and controls. Um, how often do you wear your seatbelt? Most of the time, only about a quarter of gunshot cases did, closer to a half of others. It, which suggests, you know, maybe there's some bias that could come from comparing these cases to controls. And, you know, and th this is a really good one. I've, I'm going to jump ahead here a little bit, but um, was it appropriate to compare these case subjects to the controls and, and hope to be free of bias and confounding? 
a great advantage, of course, to the case crossover study is that you're comparing one individual at a given time to themselves earlier. And as long as you don't compare me to myself seven years ago, um, I mean, I still have the same genetics, but I'm really pretty similar now as I was yesterday morning and the day before. Um, but when you see something like propensity for risk taking, basically, that might be a reason why you don't want to compare a given case to a given control. And, you know, we can only match your control for so many things. There are confounders that we can't even think of, let alone measure. So doing the analysis within subjects, this is one indicator of the motivation to do case crossover analysis. Um, other characteristics here um, about daily activities and history with violence. Non-gun cases were more likely to have ever been jumped than gun cases and controls. Um, and the prevalence of a few things, like ever being in jail or prison, on juvenile probation, ever been shot, 17%, um, carried a weapon, carried a gun, were higher in cases than controls. Another reason for to identify a bit of lack of comparability um, between these groups. Um, all right, so that was descriptive results. Um, getting into other results here, and, you know, back to one boy's day, we can be skeptical of that work and thinking, well, to what extent will a research participant um, really tell us the truth about some culturally sensitive things um, or, or even remember? Um, again, we were stuck with a, with a retrospective data collection here because it, we didn't find it feasible to move forward in time with a massive cohort over a long period of time to study gunshot injury in a way that would have been required. Um, and so we looked at the data after it was collected, and we take um, a little, quite a bit of comfort from seeing some results like this. So these are just control subjects, and we've cut their days into hour-long blocks, and you can see that um, at four in the morning, the great majority are inside, that's green. They're in bed asleep. By the time seven around, seven o'clock comes around, people are getting up. When eight o'clock came around, a pretty good proportion were in school, in school, in school, and that peters out later in the afternoon, as it would. I'm getting around to just saying there's pretty good face validity here, and hearing and having heard that people are telling us what makes sense for days, at least in these broad swaths of, of what they're doing. Compare that for controls um, to non-gunshot cases, relatively few in school during school time hours, and more were outside, just as two broad groups to compare. Um, and then even compare this further um, to gunshot cases. Very few were in school during school time hours. Granted, some of them were over 25, but just large cross-section. Um, fewer were in school, and a lot were outside, especially into the evening hours. So, you know, this, this story is, is making sense so far. How did we do in terms of collecting data like this? at least we see some indicator of face validity. Um, and I'm being quite sensitive to potential threats to the validity at the end of the day, actually. I think this turned out to have been done um, quite well. Here's what the data look like when we lay down one landscape. This is off-premise alcohol outlets and the density across Philadelphia and all 632 subjects. The way that we gathered data, we only put down dots on a path as often as you needed to. If someone started down Walnut Street and 20th, and they went all the way to Walnut Street and 40th, that's two miles. And if they said they walked at a constant rate the whole way, you really just had to go dot, dot, um, because nothing changed. If we did that, though, we would know nothing about the exposure they experienced in between. So we really added dots in between and boiled it down to having data that was estimated to be minute by minute. Then um, for analyses, we cut it into like 10 minute increment data. Um, and this is what those data look like. And you can see individuals moving across the landscape. And on this red mountain, you see some people going high, 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 higher in terms of the extent to which they were exposed. And then the hypothesis is that individuals were shot at a time when they were higher on a mountain than they were earlier in the day or higher on the mountain than controls at the same time of day. That's, those are the mechanics of how we then generated our odds ratios. So you get funded and you put about three years of thinking into that. 
and then you start analyzing collecting data and you put three years of work into that. Um, and by the time the data are you're on your computer, um, I'm not sure what your mood might be like, but you may come around to thinking, wow, this might be a real long shot that what we had hypothesized and tried to study is actually going to go in the direction that we thought it would. And of course, it's, it's fine that it should. If we only ask questions where we know the answers, we're not doing a very good job. But I'll tell you, the day that this graph popped up, it was um, like pretty profound. Have a look at how we interpret this graph. Left side, this is time zero, the time of being shot. And this is the extent to which, indivi to which individuals were exposed to off-premise alcohol outlets, as an example. Um, higher number means higher exposure. High at the time they were assaulted compared to um, case subjects 10 minutes before, 10 minutes before, 10 minutes before, 10 minutes before, nine hours before. It, it turns out that on average, individuals indeed were walking up a mountain of exposure on, on the course to, to being assaulted. And so that was very profound when that came out. Um, this red line is just on average to what extent were controls exposed. The value was down here. Um, and so the way that we analyze these data, case control, case crossover, at the time cases were assaulted, what was the level of to which controls were assaulted? And there are a lot of mechanics going on in the background. Patrick, we were talking about some of this stuff today. The way that we analyze these data for a given case assaulted at 7 p.m., we measured their exposure and then compared that to all those 174 cases. What was each of those individuals doing at 7 p.m.? Grab their exposure and that was like the contrast. We put a caliper around that and that was the, that's what we compared. Subject two, assaulted at five, what was everybody else doing at five? So those are the mechanics by which we did case to control and then also of course we did case to themselves, case crossover. Um, and it wasn't just a fluke with this alcohol finding. We actually laid down 27 different uh, maps of the surface layer of Philadelphia for different hypothesized risk and protective factors. And these are the ones that had that strong systematic trend. On the time leading to being assaulted, prevalence of off-premise alcohol outlets experienced went up. Um, that was on, sorry, off-premise went up. People went into areas with higher structural danger, more narcotics arrests, more vacant lots, more recreation centers, more young people, and so on. And for protective factors, they went into areas with um, fewer Hispanic population. There's the Hispanic paradox of being protective. Um, lower income, lower trust in neighbors, lower participation in groups along the lines of um, community cohesion. And so we saw this systematically for quite a few variables. Um, and again, how did we analyze these data? Well, for cases, we compared the time of being assaulted to earlier in the day. We also did a maneuver where we differenced the data and subtracted from each case the average value to which controls were exposed at the same time of day, stick with me, and then just got the differenced data as a way to take trend out of data is in case that might help to control. Turned out the results for this weren't very different from just working with the raw data. Um, this is just a snapshot at the, of the map layers of the 27 variables that we laid down. Vacant lots, percent African American, percent Hispanic, percent college educated, gun in the home, and so on. Um, and uh, oh yeah, and with so many potential confounders, of course, there's the potential for a lot of collinearity. We ran factor analysis on these exposure data after we attached it to each of the case subjects. And things really came out tightly and cleanly on this. We walked away with six factors where these individual variables, um, features of the environment, really loaded strongly onto different um, constructs like neighborhood connectedness, income, alcohol outlets, vacant vandalism, fire stations and police stations and so on. All right, so we boiled down the data to keep it manageable. And we were able to generate odds ratios. And from there, it gets into just a pretty typical um, case control or case crossover study um, using conditional logistic regression for the matching. Um, a couple of key findings. Um, being alone at a point in the day compared to controls was a risk factor of being assaulted. 
also being outdoor on foot or in a car relative to bus or trolley, or I should say relative to indoors was a risk factor. Now, of course, these aren't what we think of as typical um, modifiable risk factors, but we controlled for these factors while we looked at risk for gunshot and non-gunshot non injury, while we looked at things that we're more interested in from a public health standpoint, a policy standpoint. Um, gun carrying, there was a big question about whether having a gun on your person uh, was a risk factor. Up until then, most of that work in the past was having a gun in the home. Here was the first study of adolescents carrying a gun, and indeed having a gun was strongly associated with being shot on a given day at a given time. Um, and we didn't have enough instances of gun carrying among non-gun um, cases to estimate the effect there. We also controlled for participation, precipitation, by the way. From the weather station nearby, we got hourly data for each subject's given day of activities, and, and we matched those data, so we controlled for that. Um, and then features of the environment. Some of these we don't think of as read readily modifiable um, features of the environment, like neighborhood connectedness, but some of them we do. Locations of rec centers, oh, that wasn't a risk factor here in this, in this analysis. Um, and um, um, and uh, vacancy, vandalism, and violence was a big one um, for both gunshot and non-gunshot injury. And then, um, of course, because it was prudent, we also ran the case crossover analyses, and many of the results were quite the same. And the one that I think was so, you know, most interesting uh, for the context of, of this talk was that, indeed, going through your day and going from not having a gun on your person to having it on your person was associated with a 40% higher likelihood of being shot after you acquired the gun. Um, and we could, we could look more at other types of results as well. So, so, so that's the span of this study. That's the work that we conducted. Um, certainly there were limitations and we did our best to overcome um, many of these. Um, and, uh, and at the end of the day, we, uh, we thought that things really were, were quite sound. And if you wanna talk more afterward about potential threats and how we worked around them, happy to do that. Uh, we we're very pleased that this work run, won the Rothman Prize from the journal Epidemiology. Um, which is a bit of a testament, testament at least to its creativity, um, if not its validity. Um, and, you know, like any case control study, you're fixed with your outcome, but you can bring in additional covariates um, and many, many if you'd like to. And one of our postdocs went on to have a, a position with the U.S. Forest Service and working with people like Charlie Branis, who are very interested in greening the urban environment, um, she laid, laid over... Um, a very high um, density LIDAR image of, of canopy, tree canopy in the city, and laid down the gunshot cases and indeed found that case control study and case crossover study being under tree cover was strongly protective against the risk of being assaulted. If you wanna hear about the conceptual framework and why that might make sense, um, you can have a look at, at, at the paper that she published a couple of years ago. Um, and a couple more minutes, and I'll, and I'll wrap this up, but I just wanted to step back a little bit from the focus of that study um, to talk a little bit more about research that's going underway at our center, the Penn Injury Science Center. As we were recruiting in that study, so many youth, it turned out, had been assaulted in school. And that was an exclusion criterion for us because we wanted to study community violence. But we thought, well, let's get back to that someday. Uh, the National Institute of Justice posted a program announcement that we applied for and are now studying, a, conducting a very similar study, case crossover only, of violence in Philadelphia schools. Um, also at the Penn Injury Science Center, many other types of work going on. You know, we're one of the 10 injury control research centers, as is Michigan, um, being funded by the, re, by, uh, by the CDC. And gun violence is a large part of the portfolio for many of our investigators. Um, I talked about that we have a visiting scholar series. Dave Humphreys is a professor at Oxford in the Department of Social Policy and Analysis. He led the study of the impact of the Stand Your Ground law in Florida and found that when Stand Your Ground was introduced, it seems to have led to a very large increase um, in gun homicide in Florida. Um, Eleanor Kaufman is a trauma surgeon and a fellow at Penn. She and Chris Morrison looked at state firearms and how 
the strength of a, of a state law and its role in potentially being protective against gunshot injury in a given county, and also your proximity to other states and their laws for a spillover effect. She published that recently with Chris. Um, um, Edward, who was in emergency medicine, recently got a faculty job at Yale, looking at um, the use of non-trauma centers for the management of trauma in the United States. Chris Morrison, one of our postdocs, who just got a faculty position at Columbia in epidemiology. This is the only paper where we were very tempted to use pseudonyms for um, our names, but he looked at assaults on days leading up to the 2016 uh, presidential um, election and assaults of days during Trump campaign rallies compared to days before and after, and found indeed in cities where they held um, rallies, assault rates went up. Um, and then other types of topics beyond injury and beyond, or beyond violence and beyond um, assault also. Chris also led an interrupted time series analysis looking at the introduction of ride sharing in cities to see if that was protective, in particular against drunk driving deaths, um, Kit Delgado, emergency medicine, looking at prescriber practices um, across the United States. Uh, we do um, quite a bit of work on concussion as well and monitor young people with concussion in real time and learn about their concussion symptoms and at the same time physical activity using real time monitoring and cognitive activity to see if there's a chicken in the egg and how whether what we do has anything to do with our symptoms. We've now rolled this out and are using that as the retention mechanism in a randomized trial at three sites. Um, with Bernadette, we also direct um, the epidemiology study for the Ivy League Big Ten epi study of concussion and recently investigated a very innovative policy move that was introduced by the football coaches in the Ivy League um, to hopefully reduce the incidence of concussion during kickoff returns. They simply moved the kickoff line five yards and with the difference in differences analysis, we found evidence that it really was protective. So that is quite exciting. Uh, Bernadette is lead coordinator on that, and I'm happy to show you um, this photo of her presenting to our large group. At Penn, we focus, of course, strongly on our research, but we're really energized by the training that we do. Bernadette is one of our trainees that we love to showcase. Um, others were here at Michigan when you hosted Sabre not long ago. Gina, I was thrilled to see won um, one of the student paper awards. And it's just last night, Gina went on to work with our pal, Dave Humphreys at Oxford, and she's doing her master's there now. She was an undergrad at Penn. Um, now she's in her first year at Oxford. And just last night, we got the email from Dr. Rivara that the paper that presented there, she presented there has been accepted for publication at JAMA Network Open. So we're very interested in promoting the next generation of, of young people. What she did was look at the the dozens and really hundreds of mass shootings in the United States over recent decades and looked at whether those seem to in inspire more firearm purchasing or lead to less firearm purchasing. So very proud of Gina and all of our trainees. Within our injury center, we also run a training program in Botswana. Um, as HIV has come under control there, um, through that process, Penn started a very strong partnership with the University of Botswana and the Ministry of Health. Uh, but non-communicable diseases, including road traffic injuries, self-harm, interpersonal violence, have really gone up. So we're leading a program um, to do training and build injury epidemiology capacity in Botswana. These are folks that, that are in our training program. Um, he's a physician in the military. He's very interested in screening recruits and figuring out who's at risk for injury during basic training. Um, Olorada, she's a, a dental surgeon, a pediatric dental surgeon, who knows from what she sees and when she talks to kids, a great majority of, of fractures to the mouth that are coming in are from kids being injured on playgrounds. But they don't have any type of surveillance system and we're working with her to use REDCap to start to collect those data to identify the at-risk schools and be protective. Lydia is another, she's with the Motor Vehicle Accident Fund that receives data from all police departments of all crashes in the country. Her group even funds local groups to do prevention, um, but they're not sure where to target those prevention um, strategies. So Vicki Tam, director of our, of our cartographic modeling lab, um, recently was there along with KG, and in, um, he's faculty at University of Botswana, to introduce a mobile version of REDCap 
and map their cases that Lydia has and figure out where are the hotspots and where might they want to target their interventions. So that's the kind of very rewarding work that we're involved with um, in Botswana. All right, so that's what I wanted to cover. Much more you can read about at the Penn Injury Science Center. Um, I'm not allowed to encourage faculty to come and work at Penn, but all trainees for the next portion of your career, uh, many other training opportunities at Penn as well. So think of us, and we think of you often at Michigan on the great work that you do. So thanks for having us here. Thank you. Uh, um, so one thing that struck me having lived in Philadelphia for a few years is the, the big concerns in the Midwest and the weakness of alcohol-related laws. Um, so I'm wondering in terms of generalizability, whether you compare the number of outlets to other um, cities or states, um, and whether you think the system and access issues available in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia um, whether you can have more outlets perhaps other places would lead to more um, assaults, or whether you think it would be the same. I mean, in, that's very speculative. But. You know, good question. And I, I know there are many studies that in general look at density of outlets and rates of assault. I don't know whether those in vary between Philadelphia and other environments. If anything, I think policy in Pennsylvania is working for us. Alcohol laws date back to the Puritan days. And when I say there are 1,700 outlets, like there really are, and people say in Pennsylvania, um, liquor licenses are like energy. They can't be created, they can't be destroyed, they can only be transferred. <laughs> There's a finite number. It actually serves us well in the consumer market for BYO restaurants. Many places want to have a restaurant, um, but they can't make money off alcohol because they can't get a license. If anything, I think it means there won't be more licenses, but there will only be fewer. But within Philadelphia, this evidence and other really suggests that off-premise outlets in particular pose a risk for assault. And so there's opportunity to think about implications for changing, for, for changing either the prevalence or just the nature of, environment, of the environment around them to be more protective. Yeah. In terms of activity space, um, you did you did the detailed mapping so incredibly interesting. Do you collect other information about other like other other activities they do during the times that they were playing games in this little house in terms of you know, were they playing youth basketball with fabulous mentors or were uh -huh. they, you know, hanging out with five guys selling crap? Like what was the difference yeah. after those? You know, we, we probed enough to hear that s someone was playing youth basketball. We didn't probe enough to hear that there were awesome mentors there. And we tape, we auto record, we audio recorded each interview. So we could go back and actually classify quite a bit more about context. Yeah, I think that we could. We didn't ask systematically, but we heard a lot about what was going on when they were in given places. So there's opportunities to, to still investigate that. Whether by not coding for some of that stuff, we missed controlling for strong confounders, um, I'm not sure. Yeah, but so that's what comes to mind. But there are more opportunities. And like any, any large data set, there are many opportunities to work further with these data. So if you're interested in partnering, you know, do let me know. And the second question I have is really cool, so we'll have to be honest. So was the design only meant? Oh, the design was only men. Yeah, yeah. I, I still want to do the mirror study now yeah. and figure out what happens with the women who get shot, which is a clear lot more probably about women. Uh, yeah, right. We, I think you would. We enrolled, a, um, a, why am I blanking on the name? Not a probability set. We enrolled about 20 women, a convenient sample of women to get some preliminary data. But because the incidence um, of gunshot we actually wrote this in, in originally only look at, to look at gun injury and only to do case crossover. But the reviewers encourage us to do non-gun injury and also gather the controls. Um, the ins with our focus on gunshot injury, the great majority of gunshot patients are men, young men, 
but also many, many non-gun assault patients are women. That's what led us down the path to study only men now, and next study should still be done uh, with young women. Uh -huh. What about random events? I mean, obviously, you can take an event, it's not random, but there's a lot of error. Some of that error could be random. I mean, there are yeah. lots of stories of random shootings uh-huh oh well you know um random victimization um i think a lot of people were shot as as innocent bystanders actually and a lot were intended victims we hardly probed on that at all because we didn't want to put individuals off and think that we were implying things in hindsight we quickly developed really good rapport with most of these subjects i think and we could have asked more but you know, could random variability be explaining this? Could that make an odds ratio of 1.4 go to null? Jason, that's what we were talking a little bit about yesterday. You're so lucky at this injury center to have a dedicated faculty biostatistician on board um, to take it. Yeah, who's that? I, I hear they're hiring. Um, um, to be able to say, well, how much bias would have to be in there to make some of these odds, odds ratios go away? And I think it would be a lot. We didn't do that in this study. With one earlier study of, of gun carrying, um, we did. Uh, but I think there's room in all of injury epidemiology to more heavily scrutinize the odds ratios that we generate and say, what would it take to have made these go null? Or for null values, what would it, how much would we, have to do, would we have had to do wrong to have missed, in fact, you know, a true positive result? Yeah. Do you have any sense of what weapon was used? Were they handguns? No, it didn't, didn't even start to ask about that. There are things that we might have done differently after, after we did it once. Yeah, don't know. Mm -hmm. The next study. Always the next study. Yep. Uh huh, Jason. Um, I agree with you. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, I agree with what you're saying that the kind of thing that Barbara was talking about would attenuate effects of that being found on this rate. One thing I was wondering though that could be the opposite was that people might have better recall on days where they had they were shot rather than on yeah. randomly selected day in the past. Yep. So that might make the place based features there larger effect sizes. And I say that's a major methodological piece of the study, so I'm wondering what you did about that. We really wrestled. And at the time we wrote this, I should look at the literature again, but I feel like it was almost 50-50. With young people as research participants who have been victims of trauma, how would that affect their recall? And that some of the literature said it might make it more acute. Some said it might make them go blank. Um, but so we pilot tested this and enrolled about 25 um, out of the CHOP and HOP ED and asked these questions, and with that sample group, we heard um, uh, pretty um, uh, stories with quite a lot, I don't know what word I'm looking for, but people with quite a bit of conviction were, were telling us um, w their perception of what happened. So we ended up thinking, you know, it made sense. And, and at the end of the day, I think we do see really good base validity in these results, like it adds up. Yeah? I'm just going to say the other thing about that is we're, we're much more creatures of habit than we think we are. Oh, yeah. So, I don't know, it may have happened today, but, you know, you know that, the one you showed us, that's probably a pretty typical pattern. Because you go to the basketball, and you know, everybody knows you can show up at 3 o'clock and there's going to be a game. Yeah. So you work your way to that spot. spot. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. If so, that's helpful. You know, if you ask me, where was I two days ago at noon? But it was a Sunday. I, I could take a guess, and then if I walked you there, I'd probably end up at the same place. Um, but um, I'm not sure if you're saying that's a benefit or if that's a potential threat. Oh, no, it was, it was more, uh, I was actually saying I'm on guard. The idea that, you know, the, the that may occur. Oh, yeah. People are probably, it may be that they're remembering they did this because kind of what they do. Could they be. Wake up, they walk to work this way. Yeah. They go, I mean, maybe it was a, a pretty typical day. I mean, we all have to have what we do every day for the last five days to be pretty similar. 
Uh huh. You know, and maybe on Monday it's different than on Tuesday, but on Monday it's pretty similar. That's right. No, I think so. And, you know, I like one boy's day, not just because it's kind of cute and it's very similar to what we're doing now, but they started, you know, where that boy woke up in the morning. We, we're starting with where were you shot, but we don't say, and then before that and before that, because we don't think that way in real life. That's why we started people, when did you get out of bed and where? And we use that to try to anchor them. And we put a map in front of them to help with wayfinding. We also did a lot of literature review, and there's quite a bit out there on can children even read a map and remember where they went. So that was a, that was a big part of this. Yeah. And I'll just say, in terms of recall, whatever the, the hazards, and I'll just, I'm sorry, I'll just talk loudly. <laughs> in terms of recall, whatever the biases are, we see in the way the vast majority of this research has been done, which is like, what have you done in the past six months? Oh, yeah. You know, tell me about the last, in the past year, have you done X, Y, and Z behavior? And yeah. And we talk about threats to recall for a lot of people. Uh huh. Yeah. You know, Rebecca, a last thought on that. Perhaps individuals underreported gun carrying, because that's pretty contentious. At no point, even during recruitment, did we say we're interested in alcohol outlets, which really was a biggie for us, because that's a, there's policy levers that we can pull. They walked us through their day, and we never mentioned we're really interested in whether you walk by an alcohol outlet. So they were totally agnostic to that. And at the end of the day, now seeing that systematically, that was a key exposure that increased over the time. And clearly they weren't avoiding telling us that because we didn't make them paranoid. Um, I think that there's just, you know, good validity in that odds ratio for one. Yeah. Thanks, thank you. thanks Rebecca. All right, thanks for coming. Yeah.